The COVID-19 pandemic brought so many new crises to the global platform. Supply chain issues and a slowdown in food production continues even as the world has moved on. Now, more than ever, we question whether we can adequately feed ourselves. Add to that the skyrocketing inflationary food prices. Immediately after taking office, the Davis administration moved quickly to try and address the issue. A promise to reduce the cost of living and perhaps encourage more local food production. Tonight, we talk food security with the minister responsible for agriculture and marine resources, as well as BAIC's chairman and general manager. This is On the Record. I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. We'll see you on the other side of this break. The project really pays itself back. Correct. They set up a, a um, at the conference, uh, uh, more uh, the more. school. As a journalist, I always have to focus on the facts, and sometimes that means going to investigate for myself. On the record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. right here on RTV. Welcome back. You're watching On The Record. First up, let's have a look at what has been going on in the news since we last spoke. A student at the Bishop Michael Eldon School in Grand Bahama was arraigned recently for threatening to shoot up the school. You may remember that a note was found in the boys' high school bathroom that said, we will shoot up the school on March 3rd. Well, the juvenile was arraigned for possession of a firearm with intent to put another in fear and threats of death and is remanded to Sandilands Rehabilitation Center for six weeks. So here's a lesson here, folks. Don't take anything for granted. Uh, we always see these school shootings as happening in, in other countries. Uh, we don't know what the intent was, but thankfully school officials acted quickly. The police were brought in and that student is being dealt with. Also, parents, you know, try and keep a finger on the pulse of your kids to see really what's going on inside their heads. In other news, the Free National Movement leader Michael Pintard calling out Prime Minister Philip Davis for providing misleading deficit figures. In his mid-year budget communication, the Prime Minister said the country's deficit stood at $285.7 million, representing a $7.8 million increase. However, when he returned to Parliament last week, he said the deficit decreased by $5.3 million. In a strong communication or condemnation of the Prime Minister's action, Pintard said Davis owes the country an apology and Davis apologized. The lesson here, we can all make mistakes, but once you do recognize it, quickly go and correct. So, um, and for the folks preparing these documents, it's important we get it right the first time. The Prime Minister did come back though and correct his statement, so good for him. Uh, it's an all too familiar story. Suspects released on bail meeting a similar fate. It's an issue that the National Security Minister Wayne Monroe says the government is working to address. Well, police arrested four people in a recent double homicide in Fox Hill. Investigators telling our news the suspects are between the ages of 18 and 25. This shooting reigniting concerns about releasing murder suspects on bail. So, you talk to the police, the courts, the lawyers, everyone involved. Um, you kind of keep getting the same response. Unless and until we are able to arrest this problem with releasing violent suspects back out into the community on bail, we are going to continue to have these problems. Um, there's a lot of discussion of where the responsibility lies and who can fix it, how, but unless and until we do something about it, 
we're going to continue in this cycle. We've addressed it many times on this show, but unless and until we'll be keep having, we will continue to have these same stories repeated over and over in the news. New revelations about the National Food Distribution Task Force spilled out in the House of or onto the House of Assembly floor. This coming as the Prime Minister detailed how hundreds of thousands of dollars in goods were recently returned to the government. So this issue is really um, a, a hot button issue lately. We keep hearing a lot about this food distribution program and what was done, what wasn't done, what's being returned. I suspect that we have more to come, but I will not say much more about it until much more is revealed. But there are many, many questions about this program that some folks have uh, to answer for. Finally, former Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Minnis coming to the defense of the group of protesters who sought to make their voices heard during the recent CARICOM meeting but ended up in handcuffs. A former Prime Minister accused the Davis administration of silencing the voice of Bahamians. So a couple things here. Um, as I continue to say, uh, people have a right to protest. The police have a right to do their jobs. Um, but I think there's fault on all sides as to how this played out. But I do caution the former Prime Minister that under his administration, there were the same accusations levied against his administration and the police force. Now, government has changed. But the same police officers, for the most part, with a few changes, are still in place. So, you know, uh, let's be mindful of some of the things we're throwing out when we, too, sat in that seat not so long ago. Well, that's it for Since We Last Spoke. Uh, be sure and hit us up on Facebook and Instagram and tell us what you think about this segment, as well as another segment we have coming up very soon. But we're going to have more on the record right after this break. project actually pays itself back. Correct. They set up a, a, um, at the conference, uh, uh, more uh, the school. As a journalist, I always have to focus on the facts, and sometimes that means going to investigate for myself. On the record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. right here on RTV. We started out with um, free range, um, as close to organic eggs as you can get. So as the demand started to grow, um, we began constructing this hen house that's right behind me. So that's a 1,200 square foot hen house um, with the goal to get it to capacity, max capacity with um, about 1,200 um, chickens. Terence Roberts, Jr., Managing Director of Berkshire Farms, talking about his bid on eggs and chicken farming. Welcome back. Well, the Ministry of Agriculture in this segment, um, we're going to have that as the Minister of Agriculture in this segment. He's the Honorable Clay Sweeting. Welcome, sir, to On the Record. Thank you so much, Earl. Thanks for having me. Um, just re We're, we're going to talk uh, to our clip in a moment, but I want to speak high level first. Mm -hmm. um, you recently spoke in the House of Assembly on your ministry's progress. You acknowledged the importance of food security and said the Davis administration intends on putting its money where its mouth is. Mm -hmm. Tell us, how is the government investing in Bahamian agriculture? And before you answer, I just want to refer really to a bit of a conversation we had about the almost shift that you have brought in the, I guess, importance to agriculture. Mm -hmm. It was always something that was, always, that was on the back burner, right. but I've noticed even in my personal space, there is a lot of attention being given yeah, to agriculture yeah. now. Yeah, so um, thanks, Jerome. And, and um, from when I first took office, one of the main things that we focused on at the ministry was getting youth and women involved in the sector. Uh, the reality is, is that 80% of our farmers are over 60 years old. So it's trying to garner that excitement into the sector, which, which we, since we have done, and, and we continue to improve on that. There's always room for improvement. Um, but for the government and, and the Davis administration, 
Um, we put a lot of funding um, into agriculture, into food security, and finding creative ways to do that. Um, you know, for us, we've made a commitment with CARICOM that we're going to do what we can to reduce import 25% by the year 2025. So we've invested a lot in, in food security, um, $6 million just in that aspect, and then other areas. So our goal is to invest $100 million during our term in agriculture alone. Do you think if we did <clears throat> not come through COVID, mm -hmm. if COVID did not create the issues um, that we had, there would be we would have this level of attention because there were a lot of times in my own you know personal space I wondered yeah. whether if this went on for much longer whether we'd be able to to, to continue to feed ourselves yeah, or so to get the stuff that we need just basic food items right so different times in history I think we come back around to this talk about agriculture if you remember September 11 um, that during that same time we had that the same talk about feeding ourselves then here during COVID then we had times when we had challenges importing food, and then we have the sense of feeding ourselves again uh, out is very important. So of course, different times um, in a country's history, you have these uh, international incidences that cause these issues. Um, that being said, what's important is once these occur and the focus is driven through agriculture, that we continue to find ways to be creative and to continue that excitement about um, this subsector. You would think food, food security would be high on the priority mm -hmm. list of every government. Right. Um, why do you think it's taken us so long again to really bring the kind of focus to agriculture that you seem to have? Yeah. I think that the reality is, is being a farmer is difficult. Um, countries around the world, farmers are heavily subsidized. So for, for me and my ministry, what we did is we looked at areas where you have bankable products, where we're able to, to drive a certain area in agriculture, and then banks are willing to finance, or um, persons or institutions are willing to finance because they know that these areas of agriculture will not only help to feed you or feed the country, but also persons could make money. And that's where we look at containerized farming, vertical farming, which are bankable. You know that you're going to you're going to collect 10 pounds of lettuce on a Monday, 150 pounds, whatever it is. You know, it's, the consistency is there. Mm -hmm. And the market is, is, we know the market's there. Um, same thing with, with poultry. So that's what we're trying to do, is to try to drive those areas that are bankable. Persons can make money. You have to drive the economy. Um, you have to uh, put people to work. You reduce your import. So it's a win-win in all these aspects. But the for me, it's to ensure that people, once they get involved in whatever areas in agriculture, they could continue to thrive because they're making money. I guess this goes back, or it now ties into my question about sustainability. Because right. starting in is great. I think we do a great job as a country with, with bringing ideas to mm -hmm. the public. We're mm -hmm. going to do this, we're going to invest in that, right. and then something happens, and it, and it fizzles away. What's the plan to make this all sustainable? Right, so, so that's, that's piggyback on that. So sustainability is finding areas that are you can farm every day of the week, or you can grow chickens so, or whatever area, and then you have a market where you have access to. So these areas, you know, for the most part, um, crops are seasonal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that would be a longer trend to get soil testing involved, to get to, to try to garner to ensure that these persons farm this type of fruit or vegetable on this land because it's, um, it's sustainable. But with areas such as poultry, you could farm through the year. Um, vertical farming, you're protected against hurricanes because they're indoor. Um, so these areas are what the ministry is, is heavily focused on, um, you know, to ensure that even if something may happen, a storm might come or, or we might have some issues in one way or another, that it could continue past administrations, past governments, past ministers, so that we can help to grow in that regard. I know that very early on, um, as a country, we started to develop this 
uh, system of the packing houses mm -hmm. where people on the islands would be able to farm um, or you know be able to yeah gather and right. put in a packing house and then things mm -hmm. came to that so over the years that floundered right. um, there were many issues um, and while I see it on some levels because you see some of the produce coming is there anything being done really to improve that system so that um, there is some guarantee of the freshness of the produce um, or whether it's poultry or whatever it is, the freshness, mm -hmm. to guarantee that from field to market. Right. So um, with you saying that about freshness, what's interesting, um, which a lot of people don't know, is that most of the food we consume that's imported, we lose 75% of the nutritional value of that food by the time it, it reaches in country. So I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> so, so that ties to that. Wow. Um, so even the, so, the food that's grown here that you get in the food sort of in one week, two weeks, the nutritional value is much larger and it's much healthier for Bahamians. And that's why we created the Ministry of Health and Wellness out to tie into that. Um, the packing house does serve a a way where we can help to su support farmers that otherwise wouldn't have support. But the reality is too is that to drive economies, the private sector must be involved. And that's why when you get these bankable project, projects, the private sector helps to drive those as well because it's something that they want to buy for their guests, whether it's Atlanta, Baltimore, resorts throughout the family islands, because they too want good produce. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the reality is the awareness for, for healthy living it's much higher now than it's Everywhere. been in some time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a global, it's, it's a global it's, movement. It's a global movement. Mm -hmm. So, with with us tapping into that and tapping into the market access, we we want to partner and help to drive and make the, those relationships where farmers are then tied to the private sector, where they're able to sell direct to them, not just in the packing house. The packing house is there to support farmers in different er areas in one, but the packing house by themselves cannot drive the agricultural economy without uh, the private sector, whether it's distributors, wholesalers, buying into this national um, element, what we're trying to do. Um, I want to talk about the Berkshire Farm Initiative first up, and then I've got another question just about how do we improve the overall image. But um, <coughs> we started the segment with a clip um, right. from the Berkshire Farm Initiative. Tell us about that and how timely that is, given the, the cost of eggs globally. Right. Yeah, so, um, you know, for us, we've been trying to drive a sector that's bankable, and Berkshire Farm is, is one, one of those elements that's, that's doing that, and um, other farmers throughout, throughout the country as well. But for us, we're also trying to find ways to expand on that, um, on, in egg production. So that's just one farmer um, that's done a, a wonderful job. I think he said he had 1,200 uh, birds, so that's roughly 1,200 eggs a day if, if they get the right food, right lane, mash, and all of that. So we want to continue to expand and, f and farm us throughout the country. Um, and that's why we, we you know, launched the Golden Yolk Project. Help well. the audience to understand <coughs> what that will mean for, one, reducing the import bill, but also helping to reduce the cost of eggs. Because I can tell I stop buying yeah. eggs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I could do it out. Right. You know, um, but because the, the price was so high. So right. what can an initiative like this do to help to reduce the import bill? And what does that mean right. for us economically? So the Golden Yolk Project has various elements. Um, that's what's so exciting about it. Number one, it's bankable. Uh, number two, it would it would um, eliminate imports on egg production. Currently, we import seven. I mean, currently we produce seven hundred and fifty thousand eggs per year in country. This would produce twenty eight million eggs per year once finalized. Another thing is, when you produce your own food, you are able to stabilize the price of eggs. You know, eggs went from three dollars a dozen to $11 in some islands. So this would help to stabilize that. It also drives the economy, economy because you get farmers involved um, where there you have around 95 jobs being created initially with uh, six grow houses in New Providence, 38 across the family islands. Um, that doesn't even include spin-off opportunities. So you can stabilize the price of food. Um, this project also reduces imports by 1%. You know, over the past 30, 40 years, we have increased what mm -hmm. we import. This would decrease by 1%. Plus, it keeps $12.5 million in country. That's what we spend on eggs every year. So that is ticking all the right boxes mm -hmm. in all the right places. Oh, you know, 
I remember growing up and, you know, in school, they talked about a, jobs in agriculture. And I remember my classmates and friends going, I am not going to work in a hot sun and no field. Mm -hmm. it, it was always a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. How do you take um, that, the, you know, that stigma almost with the farm out there and the back breaking, yeah. you know, heat in the soil out there every day? How do you take that now? and change that perception so people see it as a viable, you know, not so, to, mm -hmm. pardon the term, not so dirty industry, something right. that people can feel proud about doing. Right. I th well, I think that different areas in this country have been able to do that. Sure. I, you look at the fishing industry mm -hmm. in the 70s, in the 80s, it was looked at as a, a subsistence type living where you wasn't really that successful. Uh, we've been able to create economies uh, whether it's in Eleuthera and Spanish Wells and Abaco, uh, in New Providence as well, where mm -hmm. you have f fishermen that are doing very well economically through that industry. So I, I, for, for me as a minister, I think as you just, you set an example with a few individuals where you look, these contractual farmers in the poultry sector, just in egg production alone, can make fifty to $80,000 a year, just in that one alone subsector. Um, it's being done in Guyana being done in Jamaica. So I'm sure that we can do it in the Bahamas. I think it was just creating the right environment, the right format, and that's what we want to do with this project. It's not government driven, it's government supported, but private driven. I, I have to tell you, you know, you're certainly on the right track with it. Just looking at it, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I thought to myself, now this is really the right image. Right. This is something I think young Bahamians would want mm -hmm. to get involved mm -hmm. with. We've spoken extensively about agriculture, but you mentioned it in your last um, response, and that's to do with, uh, you know, marine resources, which right. is a part of your your um, portfolio. What's being done to encourage? Because I know you know that you've mentioned those sectors that have done well, mm -hmm. um, but our vast uh, marine resources give us an opportunity mm -hmm. to tap into another you know source of, of economic wealth but what do we what do you what's the ministry doing to encourage that sector right. so so currently well we just f um, finalized a grant program along with SBDC um, the the Department of Marine Resources are traveling throughout the country we're supposed to do a a workshop in um, South Eleuthera in a few weeks help to train young persons who want to get involved, how to make parts, will provide the supplies and all of that. We also are looking at expanding um, what we do, not just with, with fish and, and lobster, but also uh, sponging and, and, and other areas where we have a market. Um, just this past few weeks, mm -hmm. I've been made aware that sponging is, it seems to be on the increase with individuals in the Southern Bahamas. Really? So at a time when a few years, ago, well, the decades ago, mm -hmm. where sponging was not viable, uh, now um, and, and persons in Long Island and, and, and down Cat Island and down that way are um, very happy with the amount of sponges they're, they're collecting. That's interesting. I definitely want to look into that. As the saying goes, sponge of money never done. <laughs> so maybe we'll be singing that again very soon. Minister, we are uh, unfortunately out of time. We've covered a lot yep. in a short period, but thank you for updating us and, you know, and for the profile you're bringing to, the, to, the, to these industries, because it's yep. not just agriculture. Yep. You know, I, I want to encourage you to keep up the great work because I think we have an opportunity here, yeah. yes, um, we do. and hopefully COVID, uh, you know, was not all gloom and doom, but has given us, you know, maybe a new lease on some yeah. things yes, sir. we would not normally have thought of. But thank you very much, and continue thank to do you. the good work. We will. All right. So thank you very much for joining us today. Of course, we're looking forward to having you back another time. Next up, the chairman and general manager at the Bahamas Agricultural and Industrial Corporation. Also, what is the public saying about food security? All that and more when On the Record returns. The project really pays itself back. Correct. They set up a, a um, at the conference, uh, uh, more uh, the school. As a journalist, I always have to focus on the facts, and sometimes that means going to investigate for myself. On the record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. right here on RTV. Welcome back tonight. 
we are talking about food security. It's one of uh, my favorite points in the show. It's time to hear from you, our viewers, this week's question. Do you think the government is working well towards establishing food security in this country? Our Joshua Williams took to the streets to get your responses. Here's our man on the street, the tweenies. Food store shoppers pitched in and gave us their thoughts on food security in the country. The International Trade Administration reporting in October of last year that the Bahamas imports over 90% of its food, costing approximately $1 billion. These residents believe that government organizations such as BAMSI should play more of a role. Until we get BAMSI and all the other people that are growing these things, maybe things will change. But, you know, like they've just started a couple of years ago and like we've been importing for many years now. So things have to change. I guess it will change as time goes on. But we need to begin to search ourselves. Does everyone have at least a sweet pepper tree growing in the back of their yard? You know, we've got to begin to do this stuff. You know, uh, instead of having to wait to import, government can't make me do anything I don't want to do. So I think maybe if government start a program encouraging us and of some of the people employed at the Ministry of Agriculture to come around to our houses and show us how to plant, that might help. Then there's Raquel Poitier, a local restaurant owner who says a decrease in produce and poultry has made things a bit difficult. She says while she believes the government is doing a great job in securing food for the nation, prices can be dropped on these items. Reduce some of the prices on wholesale items um, that you know can assist basically with the restaurant as well and with other local restaurant owners as well, you know, because that's something that really needs to be decreased in order to make businesses more prosperous and more beneficial to us. These residents say backyard farming is the answer. You need to grow your own thing. Do your own thing. You know what I mean? You get land for it. Cultivate the land, do what you got to do. They help maintain the country. I mean, I just get this pineapple. This doesn't smell like no little pineapple. Where is it coming from? So I think they should promote the, that in the schools from primary school and up. They should have uh, uh, school gardens and have the kids learn from a young age how to farm and that type of thing. I'm on the record. <laughs> I'm on the record. I'm going for Hilo. My name is Raquel Poiter and I'm on the record. I'm Dr. Colleen Fitzcharles and I'm on the record. And I'm Joshua Williams reporting for On the Record. Thanks a lot, Joshua. Now back to our discussion on food security. Chairman of BAIC, Leroy Major, and the Corporation's General Manager are here as well. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you so much for um, coming to On the Record. This is your first time with us in this space, so thank you for being here. It's good to be here. Thanks for having us. All right, BAIC is doing a lot of great stuff. Um, you gentlemen are really heavily involved with that. Um, there's no longer a thought or... Um, uh, this doesn't live as a pie in the sky for us anymore. I mean, I've been in this business long enough to know that we've talked this talk for a long time. And in many instances, um, I see things that are happening, not that they weren't before, but I see a lot of things moving. Um, and if I can just use the term, it seems like a lot of projects now have legs. You know, we're moving along. Tell us, um, from your perspective, um, how is the industry evolving and changing? We have been doing farming on some levels, I think, from the days of the Lutheran adventurers. When people landed here, they needed to live and eat, so they, they were farmers. But from your perspective, how is the industry changing? How are things evolving? What, what I have discovered is that our government, um, Bray Davis New Day government, have on its agenda, as a matter of fact, the three first line items in our budget is really food security. And so this big massive change really stems from the vision of our prime minister. He said, listen, we're in a dire state as a country. The world is in a dire state. The Bahamas have to learn to feed itself. So I'm going to make it a priority that the Bahamas at least start doing something. And so the whole, this is not just a, a sector. The government is pushing food security. What do you think is needed now, though, to really get more Bahamians to take this seriously as a viable industry? As I, I spoke to the minister about, you know, I knew growing up and being in school, this was something that we didn't even consider. You know, we wanted a job in banking or tourism or, heaven forbid, journalism. <laughs> but, you know, what's needed now to get 
I think more Bahamians to really take this seriously, not as just a, a backyard thing or a thing to make a, a couple of dollars. Um, listen, we have a lot of farmers out there who are serious, you know. Uh, as a matter of fact, since becoming chairman of BAIC, I have learned so much from the various farmers. We have hundreds of farmers out there who love what they're doing, who is excited of this new move. But the difference back then and now is that the government is supporting the farmers 100%. You know, and I think you're going to see a great dynamic change when it comes to agriculture in the Bahamas. Uh, um, based on the number of projects that we're going to roll out that will invite the farmers. But back then, a lot of the farmers were really disjointed. And it's to really see the, the truth about what this country could produce, once the farmers are, are united, you will see the big difference. Troy, let's talk about the family islands and family islanders and how right. are we involving them um, in this process even more. Sure, but if I could just kind of dovetail on sure. uh, your prior question. You know, you have some watershed moments like September uh, 11, 2001. Mm -hmm. You have a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. You have a Dorian that kind of exposes the fractures in our supply chain, exposes the fractures in our production as a nation. And when the whole world now contracts in terms of its own resources, each nation looking out for themselves, mm -hmm. it begins to signal to countries, particularly small countries like ours that have been so dependent that perhaps now is the time for us to begin looking at how do we successfully begin to provide for ourselves. And so coming out of the global pandemic, I think as Mr. Major alluded to, uh, this particular government has decided to make food security, food sustainability and food sovereignty a priority. To the question about the family islands, um, ultimately, you know, for too long, people have said that many initiatives have been Nassau-centric. And so in the wisdom of this particular administration, and particularly at BAIC and the leadership of Mr. Major, looking at this project, uh, it was thought best to create opportunities, one, to mitigate any risk challenges that may happen. So for mm -hmm. example, in the event of a catastrophic hurricane in New Providence or in Abaco or wherever, that you would still have islands that are in production so that we're not wiped out if one particular island is affected. Additionally, how do you now create economic opportunities in multiple places, allowing people that may have an affinity and a history of being involved in agriculture to participate? I think, as with so many other things in our country, um, while it sounds great to have a chain of islands um, that have their own culture and, and, and so many other things, uh, when you talk about servicing so many different islands, it becomes expensive, um, it becomes a challenge sometimes. What, you know, being a chain of islands, how does this impact our ability um, to really farm um, uh, uh, and fish um, and have livestock production. How does this impact our ability to do that on a grander scale? Because unlike the great United States, which can truck things, um, truck produce, etc., we've got to get it to a, a port, we've got to get it, whether it be a seaport, an airport, uh, we've got to move these things around. And so there are logistical challenges. Does our makeup really impact our ability to do well? So Logistically, I mean, we all obviously have the logistics in place. We have mail boats. Sure. Uh, and, and the production, uh, Jerome, for the family islands are really centered on providing what is needed in that particular locale. So it isn't that they'll be overproducing and having to ship uh, the produced eggs from the family islands back to New Providence. It really is for them to become So I produce what I need? Yes. Okay. With a view also of uh, expected growth in the years to come as well. So they'll be able to produce what they need with some future forecasting provided for as well. I, I, just made you were gonna say something or can we move on? I, I wanna talk about these eggs that we have on the desk and we're not about to do a cooking show. I just wanna make that abundantly <laughs> clear. So these eggs are a part of a great initiative that we, we touched on in, in the last segment. Um, but tell us, you know, what what is this now an indication of the fact that we have this, I think it's Golden Yolk uh, project and what is this designed to do and do you really see this as a catalyst um, for similar projects in the future? Sure, I think that this is, uh, this is the foundation. This is going to grow, you know, as it is now. Like I tell farmers, you know, listen, right now this is a project. 
is not going to stop as a project. This is going to be an industry mm -hmm. because there's so much spinoff that we could gain from this simple project. Um, as it is now, we have hundreds of people um, calling us. They want to get involved. And it is literally, it is literally growing. In the next few weeks, we're going to be breaking ground to start building structures in place because, like I said, it is a mandate and an initiative that is must carry on. Not only so, it is very lucrative for farmers, you see? And it will help the country because we will reduce the importation of eggs in this country. Hopefully, we would like to be self-sufficient, and that, that is our aim. So we could slice a piece of pie off and realize that the Bahamas is now self-sufficient in eggs, now we could roll on to another project, you see. But this is a great initiative. There's farmers so there now who are producing eggs, and they are, they are also included in part of the program. How do we make it sustainable, though? I, I remember Gladstone Farms. I remember growing up and we had our own chickens and eggs that we were growing um, in great numbers. Mm -hmm. I, I know, uh, you know, when we had two chicken farms mm -hmm. on Carmichael Road, yes. that provided all of the local poultry, but then they were all wiped out. How do we make this sustainable? This is a great start, but how do we make it sustainable? We can make it um, sustainable by getting more people involved. You know, one time we depend on Gladstone Farm, then we depend on Sunshine Farm. What, 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 and, and matter of fact, each of those farms were independently run. Yeah. And so I think what will make this unique is that um, every farm out there will work together and to ensure that all of the eggs that you produce get to a centrally located um, um, processing place where it's a sterilized package and out for market. So we'll have all these farmers um, who will be, have their own chicken houses producing their, their own eggs. And if something go wrong with the processing, um, unit, guess what? Those farms are still there operating. And so instead of you depending on one person to sustain this country, you have hundreds of farmers around. So it's a network. It. It's a network. It's a network. Right. Additionally, when you talk about a project like this that will be couched in a policy prescription that is supportive of local production, that now creates the environment where farmers can thrive and sustainability is almost uh, you know, assured, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, the extent to which all of the mechanisms to make it succeed over the long term are in place, because now you don't have any conflicts with what the independent farmers mm -hmm. are doing mm -hmm. and what perhaps at the regulatory or the policy level that there is a conflict. It's all now working, working together, together in tandem. Um, we've talked about um, farming. We've talked about eggs and chicken we talked about the poultry side of things i want to talk though about uh, a little bit more about livestock um we have some islands i'm going to use long island for instance that's famous for their mutton mm -hmm. um we have other you know islands and we have other folks out there who are doing it on a small scale what is the what's the plan or what's the effort for uh, you know our livestock and 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 bringing those products to market because listen I, I sometimes a, a piece of a side of beef in the in the grocery store it's twenty five thirty dollars like, this is too rich <laughs> for me to afford it is astronomical so you know what are the plans or are there plans in place to to um, really give some you know uh, some support to that that side of the industry we have we have been doing some work on that as a matter of fact no longer than last week I've been engaging uh, in a conversation with a few of the livestock farmers and some of the things that they lack okay we need the market all right but the market is there no but what happened they still import these items okay they still import these these meat what need to happen is that again we need a sector it need to be um, organized all right um, this is something people are going to eat. We got to make sure that um, there is a, a place that that a farmer could come in and really um, have his livestock slaughtered. Make sure that the, the meat itself is cut because when you import mutton stuff from the states, right? Those when you look at it, it's, look at you could eat it out of the package. Yeah, no, okay. it is clean. It looks exactly, great. Exactly, exactly. You know, it looks and, great. And so, yeah. and so it really needs to be organized. I did just the work the other day, right? In in America, in Florida. Mm -hmm. Florida import mutton from Australia. And when, here we have a, exactly, a potential right here. Exactly. We're, we're almost out of time. Two things I want to throw on the table very quickly. Future job opportunities and do you think that we will get to the point uh, in our lifetimes where we will be exporting, unless um, I sell that mutton, to Florida? Yes. Yes. In short order. Listen, the Bahamas did it before. All right? And we could do it again. 
All it takes is for the farmers to be united. The farmers, we have, we have instructions in place, and if we could just get this, uh, okay, BAIC is working on a crop scheduling program, mm. okay, where we're going to assign particular crops to various farmers. Instead of all the farmers growing the same thing at the same time, we want, we want variety, not only variety, we want quality and quantity. Once we get that and it's organized, then the Bahamas say, you know something, we have enough, we can feed ourselves, hey, let's get let's some more farmers involved, we can start exploring. Troy, I want you to get a last word on job opportunities. This sounds great, you know, but we're always looking at diversifying, you know, giving our, our people more job opportunities. Right. So, uh, but one thing I'd just like to kind of go back to the livestock farmers. Yes. Also, uh, I think Chairman Major may have alluded to it that um, the feed mill, the animal feed mill, that will not only be supplying feed for the poultry okay. items, but also for livestock items, because oh, the agriculture physical plant has been, uh, you know, kind of not uh, advanced for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. and so. Uh, one of the key components of this Golden Yolk project is a new feed mill that will also, again, provide feed for the birds, but also for livestock. Fantastic. In terms of job opportunities, um, again, when, you talk, when you're not talking about building out a sector instead of just a few businesses, this is a whole sector with an entire value chain. So you're talking about the egg laying, you're going to need truckers, you're going to need marketers, you're going to need logistics, you're going to need vets, you're going to need all of these things now become a part of the sectoral plan as opposed to just thinking about it as, well, six grow houses in Nassau right. and 38 grow houses on the family right. islands. We're it's looking at nice. building out the entire value chain. It's an yes. industry now. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yes. 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 And so, yes. you know, I, I encourage you, though, you know, as, as you're building this, to encourage our young people mm. to look at these opportunities. Far too often, I think we take the easy road. Um, and it's uh, we're going to get a job in a bank or at a hotel or... One last thing, too, in terms of this particular Golden Yolk project, there are some set-asides, Jerome, you'd be happy to know, for youth, mm -hmm. for women, and for the disabled. Wow. So it is a very inclusive and a sustainably thought about uh, project and business model that wants to integrate all of those sectors of our society. Finally, before we go, final, last, last question. <laughs> Are we able to fund all of this? All of this sounds wonderful. Do you have the funding to make all of this happen? The government is making it possible. As it is now, we have half of the fundings for it. Um, a lot of the houses have already been um, um, paid for. The mill has already been um, paid for. And all the mechanism is in place. You know, so the, go the government is serious, the government is providing the funding, and we are there. I see you let the chairman answer that money question. <laughs> <laughs> gentlemen, thank you so much. You know, um, this has been a great discussion because it's the kind of thing that's part of the It's not always sexy. That's mm. not always controversial, but it's yes. important. Yes. And I'm happy that you all are really at the forefront pushing this to get us to think about this. This is such an important um, it is such an important industry, mm -hmm. and if COVID taught us nothing else, it taught us really the fragility yes. of our um, food supply chain yes. and how we have to be so much more self-sustained and self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. And so I thank you for the for the good work that you're doing, and um, you have my word that we'll have you back on. Thank you. All right. Appreciate now, it. I can't tell you could bring livestock the next time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the eggs. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you. So thank you so so much uh, again to our guests for this segment, this to Mr. Leroy Major, he's the chairman of BAIC, and Troy Sampson, he's the general manager of BAIC. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Our final break, and when we return, we're going to take a look at what's trending on social media. That's always the most fun for me. It's an exciting segment, a new segment, still for us. We're going to be back with that right after this. The project really pays itself back. Correct. They set up a, a um, at the conference, uh, uh, more uh, the school. As a journalist, I always have to focus on the facts, and sometimes that means going to investigate for myself. On the record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. right here on RTV.
You're watching On The Record. It's time now for one of my favorite segments, What's Trending on Social Media. So Clinton LaGuerre says, after Hurricane Dorian, everything went uphill and still going uphill for him. He says he qualified for the 400-meter hurdles in 2020 and 2021, but Carifta got canceled both years. He is now qualified for the 2023 Carifta. He says it all took place with patience and blessings from God. I love this tweet because it shows persistence and also delayed, not denied. Uh, a good story to follow. It just shows that, you know, persistence really does pay off. All right, on to something international now. CBS this morning posted severe turbulence, left seven people hospitalized after Lutanza flight went into a free fall, sending people and food into the air and forcing the plane to make an emergency landing in Virginia. So... As a nervous flyer, I can tell you these are the types of things that really worry you. It also goes to show that despite all of the safety mechanisms, we still have to respect the skies. We have lots of planes up there all the time, and things can go wrong. Thankfully, nobody was injured too severely, although people were hospitalized. Nobody died, so thank God for that. But it just goes to show that anything can happen up there at any time. Okay, back home now. The Road Traffic Department's Instagram post says the Department of Road Traffic under the Ministry of Transport and Housing kicked off Road Safety Week with Road Safety Visibility Day, where the Road Traffic Department staff, officials from the Royal Bahamas Police Force and other civil servants canvassed various roundabouts and traffic safety tips and information on pamphlet along with road safety wristbands. It's Road Safety Week Bahamas and the theme is slow down to stay alive. Uh, we chose this, you know, for a number of reasons. We have a lot of bad drivers out, of the, out there. We have a lot of careless drivers with people on their phones, speeding, not paying attention. So really this is an opportunity for us to slow down and stay alive. One life is one too many out there. So kudos to the folks who are getting out there and, and really getting involved, civil servants, road traffic, police, all the folks involved. So good job. Hopefully people heed the warnings, okay? So uh, Adonis Creed Stan posted the sack. Big red machines are your 2023 BAISS track and field championships. Then sarcastically says, nobody saw this coming. I love it. It was hysterical. We all know that the big red machines are the reigning champs. No other school has their record. I'm not getting into a back and forth with SAC people, uh, but they are very patriotic. Uh, they're always out there in big numbers. As you can see from the photos, they were out there in large numbers. They swamped the field. It was a great showing of school spirit, uh, but it was very, very hilarious. Nobody saw this coming. Again, I'm not getting in any back and forth. The big red machines are very territorial, and they carry on bad, but congratulations. It's a job well done. Being a St. Anne scholar, we'll see you all at the debate championship. All right, so... Uh, Denzel Bazard, after reposting an R News post on a recent murder, says the only reason why you would let someone who's indicted for or you know, who's been char uh, who's suspected of six murders out on the streets is because you know he would be a victim of vigilante justice. That's going to have a long-term negative effects for the legal system operation and proper legal reform. So we address this at the top of the show. We have a huge problem with uh, a lot of folks who are out on bail, one, continuing to commit crimes, and two, um, ending up murdered in many instances, uh, and it's a vicious cycle. It's really uh, put a stain on the community in many ways, and it continues to raise concern about what should be done. If somebody is proven to be, or seemingly um, a threat to society, why do we keep giving them bail? I know the answer to that question, but it's something that we seriously, seriously need to address. So that's going to be it for our social media trends and for On the Record this evening. Special thanks to our guests, the Agriculture Minister, Clay Sweeting, as well as Mr. Leroy Major. He's the chairman of BAIC, as well as Troy Sampson, general manager of BAIC. Thanks, guys, for a great discussion today. I really, really, really enjoyed it. And thank you to our viewing audience for watching. We look forward to seeing you right back here for another exciting discussion on a topic that directly affects the lives 
of the Hague. Until then, I'm Jerome Sawyer. We'll see you again soon.